So let's turn to Lesson 38, which addresses the question, what are the challenges of the participation of the United States in world affairs? Now, given the long and costly engagement of the United States in the Middle East, the threats of terrorism and the complications of foreign affairs, some people want to severely limit American engagement in international affairs, even though America has been engaged in foreign affairs since its founding. So let me ask you, so why is international engagement inevitable? It's inevitable because of globalization. Globalization is the permanent interest of one nation in another, and it can be for a variety of reasons related to economics and cultural exchanges. There was a time when the United States could make choices between being internationalist versus isolationist. And that trajectory went back and forth throughout the 19th century and even into the early 20th century. But after World War II, there is very little sustained support for isolationism in practice, maybe in theory, but not in practice. How does the Constitution provide for the United States' role in the world? The Constitution looks at world affairs very similarly to domestic affairs. While it is commonly understood that the president has certain leadership qualities, in reality, the Constitution allows foreign policy to be a three-branch operation, just like any other policy question. Congress is listed first in the Constitution. In addition to domestic economic power are a variety of foreign policy powers, including declaring war, regulating standing armies, and in the case of the Senate, ratifying treaties by two-thirds. What about the other branches? Well, the president does not have independent constitutional authority. And this is an issue that has created a lot of controversy in both political and constitutional circles. The Article II Commander-in-Chief power that the president uses to create new areas of constitutional authority in war is actually a much longer and more complicated sentence than the Commander-in-Chief power. It says that the president shall be commander-in-chief when called into actual service of the United States. And so people differ in their opinions, but some constitutional scholars say that the president is commander-in-chief when Congress authorizes him to do so. In other words, it's not a permanent title so much as a title that is dependent upon legislative authority. What about treaty-making authority? So the president does have the responsibility to initiate a treaty, but the Senate is, has an advice and consent portion, but it has to be ratified by two-thirds. So unlike other types of executive nominations, which are by regular majority, unless there's a filibuster, a treaty must be ratified by two-thirds of the Senate. Does the judiciary play any role in international, uh, according to the Constitution? Well, it's an interesting question. So judicial review itself, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is not in the Constitution. Judicial review is not spoken word for word in the Constitution. However, the Constitution does say that all controversies that arise under the Constitution are available to the judiciary if a case comes before it. So if war powers and treaties are in the Constitution, the logical conclusion is that any constitutional question, even on international agreements and foreign policy, may go before the court.